introduction for each of our lovely three speakers. Um, so our first speaker is Dr. Lena Aguimeri, who is the co-founder of SNAP Stop Now and Plan and the director of SNAP Scientific and Program Development at the Child Development Institute, as well as an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto. For 36 years, she has led the development and implementation of SNAP and has also worked on a comprehensive children mental, children's mental health and crime prevention framework that focuses on timely referral protocols, risk need assessments, and gender sensitive SNAP models. She has received several prestigious awards, including the Prime Minister's Regional Social Innovation Award and the Elizabeth Manson Award for exemplary contributions to the promotion of children's mental health. Our second presenter is Margaret Walsh, Senior Manager in SNAP Research Evaluation and Data Systems at the Child Development Institute. She is a lead member of the SNAP Development and National Expansion Teams and heads SNAP Research and the Fidelity Framework for SNAP Implementation. She is also a co-principal contributor on the latest SNAP model, SNAP Youth Justice, and is a sought after presenter for her expertise on gender effects, evaluation frameworks, research and program development, and fidelity protocols. Last but not least, we have Dr. Nina Sokolovic, who is the uh, SNAP project lead at the Child Development Institute, where she is leading the expansion of SNAP's digital tools and programming. Dr. Sokolovic has 10 years of experience conducting research and designing programs to promote the well being of children and families around the world. She graduated summa cum laude from Harvard, recently completed her PhD in developmental psychology and education at the University of Toronto, and is a former Fulbright scholar. So welcome to all three of you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules to speak with us today. And I'll hand it over to you for the main presentation. Excellent, Sarah. Sarah Nakila and Pranima who can't be here, we just wanted to really extend our uh, thanks to having us here. Um, and on behalf of the Child Development Institute for all the support that you continue to afford us. Thank you. So I'm gonna start this presentation off and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna tag team, Nina and I, and then at the end, uh, both all three of us, Mark, Nina and I will be uh, able to address any questions that anybody has. So here we go. So Akila, thank you for doing the land acknowledgement. We too want to acknowledge, and I just wanna also add that we wanna acknowledge that racism and colonialism are both historic as well as present and that it is our responsibility to serve as allies, to listen, to respect, to learn, and to try to do better. So we're gonna talk about SNAP, and then we're gonna get into the coaching app, uh, which Nina is gonna take over. So SNAP stands for Stop Now and Plan. It's an evidence-based, trauma-informed, gender-sensitive, and cognitive behavioral model that really is about teaching children with disruptive behavior problems and their caregivers how to stop and think before they act and make better choices in the moment. And it's really about linking your thoughts, your feelings and your actions. So we're gonna share a little video first. So this way you can kind of get the sense of what SNAP is. This is actually a role play that was um, redone because the original role play we can't show, which was a fantastic role play of one of our kids in group doing a SNAP uh, using SNAP in a, in a role play. So we actually redid this role play. There's nothing magical when you think it feels a bit magical. What we did was we actually really slowed this down so that you can see what we think we think might be going on. So see if you can see the stops, the, the, the now and which is the yellow light and then the, um, the plans. May I please have my ball back? No. It's not yours, it's mine. I know. Every day, children are faced with making difficult choices in the moment. At this moment, Johnny is starting to get angry. I want my ball back. He took my ball. I want to hit him. I want to hit him. Johnny is using an emotion regulation cognitive behavioral technique called SNAP. SNAP has taught Johnny how to calm his body and emotions and replace his hard thought, I want to hit him, with a cool thought. If I hit him, he won't be my friend and he'll get in trouble. Maybe I can get my ball back if I can ask him nicely. Can I please have my ball back? No. I said give me my ball. No. Before learning SNAP, 
When Johnny felt angry, he would lose self-control. Using Snap helps Johnny control his body by using calming strategies, challenge his hard thoughts, and make a plan to keep his problems small. I'm gonna hit him. Asking nicely didn't work, but I have to stay calm. Maybe I can ask him to give me my ball back again. Asking and saying please didn't work. What's worked before? I wanna hit him. I'm just gonna hit him. I have to slow my breathing down. I can handle this. I need to pick a plan that's gonna work for me. I'm gonna tell him the ball is special to me. May I please have my ball back? It's my favorite ball and my mom bought it for me. Okay, here you go. Oh, thanks. SNAP helps children make better choices in the moment, building healthier and stronger children, families, and communities. Okay, so I hope you got the sense of what exactly SNAP is. It's really teaching kids how to stop and think before they act. So what happened was in 1984, there, Canada raised the age of criminal responsibility from seven to 12. And so therefore, which was a great move across uh, our country, but that left a huge service gap and it was identified and people felt these kids were untouchable and there weren't services available for these kids. And what we know is that there is strong evidence that indicates that there are seven years of warning before a juvenile or a child struggling can become a serious lying chronic offender. So you can see from that last box, children who end up in court for committing a serious violent offense at 14 and a half, if you go back into their trajectories, you can see that they start to really struggle. Kindergarten teachers will tell you when they're really concerned or grade one teachers of, of their child. And then you can see that by the time they're 9.5, they're committing more moderate serious behavior problems such as theft and possibly shoplifting. And by the time they're just before their 12th birthday, they commit their first serious delinquent offense. And at 14 and a half, they're in court for committing a serious violent offense. So seven years of warning, seven year incubation period. And when we think about these kids, what we need to remember is what might be going on and how many individuals cross their pathway. So what we did was we reviewed the knowledge base and the literature. We looked at all the, uh, all the literature out there that what is the best practice for young children who may be experiencing these issues. And that's how we actually end up creating the under 12 outreach project at that time, that's what it was called, which is now called SNAP, the SNAP model. So in 1986, we started the program in October. So two months later, we actually fully manualized the program and opened our doors to the first X number of kids. And since that time, since 1986, we have conducted multiple evaluations, quasi-experimental, pre-post uh, fidelity designs, small randomized control trials, and really start to um, establish our fidelity practices. And then in 1996, because of the research, because of the work that we had been doing um, in regards to measurement-based care, we realized that we needed to become gender specific. And at that time, not only did we become gender specific, we became a continued care model. And as a result, we created the SNAP Boys Program and the SNAP Girls Program. It used to be called Under 12 Outreach Project for Boys and the Girls Connection for Girls. So between 1998 and 2021, you can see there's, there's the new manual here, um, we really started to engage in doing really good risk assessments to determine level of risk need in these children. And that's when we embarked on developing the early assessment risk list. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Chris Webster come on board, who was really versed in structured professional judgment, who helped us really look at how to do this right. And so in 2001, we really started to drill down on what we were describing as a comprehensive children's mental health and crime prevention framework, which means if you have children experiencing serious disruptive behavior problems, how do you get them to the door in a timely manner, which was structured, you know, getting good referral protocols in place and bringing community stakeholders together, like child welfare and schools and children's mental health centers and community based organizations, and the police, for example, because they're the first point of entry for a lot of these kids. And then once you do that, how do you get once you get them to the door, how do you do really good risk need assessment, we were using standardized measures like the child behavior checklist and other measures, but we needed another form to be able to assess take all that information 
and then assess them for level of risk and need to determine how to move them on off that trajectory. And that's the EARLS. And then once you do that, do you have um, gender specific or specifically designed programs to meet the needs of these kids? And that's when we really focus on the SNAP model, which was really about teaching kids how to stop and think before they act and make better choices in the moment. The SNAP program doesn't just work with the child. It works with the child. It works with their family. It works with their community. It works with their school. And it works with other stakeholders that might be engaged uh, with that child. The, the program has a number of different um, care models um, that were developed out of identified needs from others who had asked us to think about this. So, we started off uh, with that moderate to high risk program. So the very first one in 1985 is we really started with the SNAP program, which was time limited. Through the continuation of the research, we realized in 1996, the program needed to be gender specific as well as continued care, especially for those extremely high risk kids. Because if they were going to slip, they were going to continue to slip between around 13 to 14. But as we started to engage with schools, because we would visit the teacher and the in the classroom to share what the strategy was for the teachers to support or the educator to support the child in the classroom, we realized the teachers were saying, well, how come I can't use this for the whole class? All my kids should learn this strategy of how to stop and think before they act. It was easy, it was simple, there was common language, and that's how we engaged in the SNAP for uh, Schools Universal Prevention Model. And as you heard, that's when we then started the SNAP Youth Justice Model because we were also getting requests and asked, could it be applied to youth? So this SNAP Youth Justice Model started in 2012 and that one is for 12 uh, to ages 12 to 18 for kids already involved in the youth justice system or probation or attendance and it's using a web-based um, modules. As a result um, of when we started developing this comprehensive model, we started to receive and put the program up for um, stringent um, reviews in order to get multiple designations to determine whether SNAP was effective, promising, or considered a model. And as a result, you can see that we've received numerous designations, not only within Canada, but within the United States, um, determining that SNAP is in, is in fact an effective model. In 2009, uh, Public Safety Canada through National Crime Prevention Centre uh, funded nine SNAP replications across Canada in multiple different, a variety of urban, rural, et cetera, settings to determine whether the program could be replicated. And as a result, since then, there have been numerous third party evaluations and studies, not only within neuroscience, cost benefit, but large scale uh, randomized control trial, for example, out of Pittsburgh, that one came out of. Our commitment is really a scientist practitioner model and really pushing measurement based care um, because we feel it's absolutely critical A to determine what are the best needs for children and families coming through the SNAP program, but then also then using the information to determine whether the program is working. And so not only do we balance clinical and research, we really balance implementation and fidelity. They're all extremely critical points. So in summary, with regards to all this research that's been done on SNAP, not only within Child Development Institute, but outside of Child Development Institute, we can see significant decreases in externalizing behaviors on things such as aggression and rule breaking and conduct problems. Out of, out of um, uh, Connecticut, a major study came out on SNAP and showing it really decreased irritability for kids that are not conduct kids or kids with disruptive, but more irritable type of kids. And that showed significant decreases as well, as well as oppositional and internalizing behaviors around comorbidity with regards to depression and anxiety. The ultimate goal is to decrease police contact and ensure no youth justice involvement as much as possible, if possible at all. Um, we also are seeing increases in self-control, emotion regulation, executive functioning, success at school, pro-social communications, and really improvement in relationships, not only with caregivers, but also with educators, as well as parent management skills improving. 
And here's just one example of neuroscience. We could show you all these different layers of it, um, but they're all published and be happy to send you these at, at a later date. Um, but here's an example. The very first study was done by Lewis Granite Woltring back in 2008. It's been repeated in 2011 by Woltring, where in just 13 weeks, they start to see major shifts from the ventral region to the dorsal region of the brain and an improvement in cognitive, um, uh, responsible for cognitive control and executive functioning and self-regulation in just 13 weeks. Another study that was just um, being published, just got accepted for publication, was done by Nathan, Dr. Nathan Kola and colleagues from uh, CAMH. And it is an MRI study. The other one that I just showed was an EEG study. And they found improvements in behavioral measures of impulsivity, which was associated with structural changes in the frontal parts of the brain, areas which are known to be linked to self-control. So that just kind of validates what we just saw previous. And regarding cost, because programs can be expensive, um, we had two or three major cost benefit analysis conducted by external parties, Dr. David Farrington from the UK and our own Dr. Chris Kogel from the city of Toronto here. What they found was that every dollar you spent on SNAP, it could yield an average of $32 up to 56 um, on conviction costs alone. And WISPI, Washington State Institute of Public Policy, also found for every dollar you spend, you save $4 and an 86% likelihood that SNAP would produce uh, benefits greater than costs, especially on the disruptive behavior scales. So that led us to being selected in 2012 by the LEAP PICO Center for Social Impact, which did a scan across Canada to determine which social innovation they were interested in scaling that had one of the most uh, best evidences to do that. Um, and SNAP was selected as their inaugural social innovation to scale. As a result, we had to raise $12 million. And the $12 million raised was to assist organizations interested in implementing SNAP with startup costs. And that was given to, to organizations pro bono. In 2015, we, um, and Marg can explain this better than I can, we started to develop a system which is called SNAP Implementation Tool which is an implementation data system that not only tra tracks pre-implementation, but implementation fidelity and outcome monitoring and also demographics and um, all kinds of other data points in regards to um, our various implementations around the world. In 2016, because of the robust findings of SNAP, we were being invited into Indigenous communities. And so therefore, we needed to make sure that this mainstream program was culturally responsive, safe, and relevant for the communities we were going in. And so therefore, we did um, a number of co-creation, co-development activities with our partners from the Indigenous community and created this guide. And as a result, in about 2015, 26, the Ontario government came to us and asked us if we could do a similar thing uh, because SNAP had been selected as the, um, as the middle years program for the Enhanced Youth Action Plan and then also for the Black Youth Action Plan. And so therefore, we partnered with one of our other community partners, Turner Consulting Group, for example, um, to create a guide um, to ensure SNAP was relevant and safe for the Black and Afrocentric community. And then that's where it takes us to where we are just before we get to the app here is in 2017, um, we began uh, through Public Safety Canada funding and a bunch of other foundations and donors, a five-year SNAP national expansion, which is coming to an end <laughs> at the end of this month. Um, five years. It feels like we've been on a marathon race, but we did it. The goal was to bring SNAP to 100 new communities across Canada. And in fact, we're at 130 communities, potentially around 160 reached, um, but around 130 with 27 international sites. And so we didn't stop here. So in 2020, we realized we needed to keep all these organizations and sites together and help with generalization and sustainability. And therefore we received a generous grant from Public Health Agency of Canada to build a SNAP community practice where we can um, bring community partners together who are delivering SNAP services, whether you're rural, urban, indigenous, black, or whatever, the, or schools, for example, that they would work together to share and learn from each other.
And that brings us to the SNAP app, which I'm gonna to turn to Nina. Awesome, thanks so much, Lena. So why did we think about building a SNAP app? Why build a SNAP app in the first place? Well, I don't need to tell the members of the audience here, uh, you all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has created a parallel mental health pandemic and that really families need our support now more than ever. We also know that there's limited in-person support available, so the supply of mental health services, even in urban areas, is strained right now. Children in the GTA are waiting between two and three years uh, to access services, and uh, you no, know, we also know that uh, in-person support is limited in rural settings as well, where there are fewer service providers. So really then thinking about this, we know that if everyone is kind of on their apps all the, uh, all the time, many of the members in the audience here may relate to the fact that uh, you feel like you're chained to your phone, you're spending so much time on it, but it's not just adults who are experiencing that. Really what we know is that also kids are spending more and more time on their phones as well. And our thinking is if everyone is using this apps, can we try to use them for good? And can some of the time spent on our phone be actually improved our mental health. Now we're not the first people to test out this idea or build a mental health app and in fact there are so many apps out there that uh, in recent years a few meta-analyses have been published of randomized trials and those meta-analyses have found small to medium effect sizes for outcomes like anxiety, depression, general well-being, and emotional stress self-awareness. So we know that there are some positive effects from these apps. However, the evidence base is really still lacking for externalizing disorders, for child and youth populations, as well as for parenting programs. And that's really the domain where SNAP works. And so that's a place where the evidence is still unclear, and we still don't know for sure whether this is going to work, but we're trying. The results I have here are from a recent meta-analysis on the SNAP program. And what you can see is that there are small to moderate effects immediately post-treatment for a variety of internalizing and externalizing problems, and that those effects actually increase over time. So that at six month follow-ups, they're more like in the moderate to large range. So we know that our uh, effects are there and they're actually improving over time. But what we're interested in testing or seeing is whether by adding a SNAP app to programming, giving children, families who are going through programming access to this app, whether we can improve and those initial effects and also improve the sustained effects over time. The reason we think this might work is because having access to an on-hand app that uh, individuals can access, not just when they're in group, but at home at any time of day, might support skill generalization. And it could also improve discharge planning and hopefully lead to a decreased need for continued services. So really stopping that revolving door of mental health services. What we're thinking then is that by adding the SNAP app to SNAP group programming, we can make it more effective, more sustainable, and more accessible. But again, this is a hypothesis that we're still waiting to test. So how did we actually embark on the process of making this app? I'd like to walk you through the journey uh, briefly here. So the first process was really about securing funding. And we're so grateful to our partners at Mental Health Research Canada and at the New Knowledge Institute uh, for believing in this goal, for kind of giving it a shot and investing in this idea. Our first step as soon as we secured funding was really to look to the literature um, and see what's been done already so that we can use best practices in our approach as well. We conducted expert interviews with those who have expertise in mental health apps. And we also conducted a bunch of focus groups with families because we know that they are really the experts on their own experience and they're the experts on what they need and what they will actually use. Once we were kind of ready with that research behind us, we identified software developers and servers to actually host the app and build the app for us. And we've been very lucky to find uh, great partners on that side as well. And with all of those pieces in place, uh, the last kind of nugget was assembling a reference group. And I wanna take a little bit of time to talk to you about that reference group because it has been such a pivotal part in our development process. So, Included in this reference group, we invited app developers, 
technical experts, SNAP participants, SNAP clinicians, as well as members of the SNAP implementation team, and Black and Indigenous community members. And this is a group that has been meeting monthly since the spring of this year in order to provide ideas, provide feedback, provide designs. And so it's really a group where kind of they bring us ideas, we work with it, workshop it, and then come back to them, get more feedback. Uh, and it's been so valuable in our development process. So really summer, and since the summer, we've been deep into the development of the design and content of this app. And that development process has really been iterative with a lot of key players at the table. The SNAP development team has brought the perspectives of their clinical expertise, really thinking about what are the components of the SNAP manuals that we want included in these apps, and also considering that initial research that we've done. The reference group has been so valuable for providing the ideas around diversity and accessibility, getting their kind of ideas on what are these current trends, and also thinking about the user experience of actually going through this app, what does it feel like for someone on the user end. Our software developers have been so helpful for kind of thinking about the feasibility of the ideas. So we've come up with ideas, the reference group comes up with the ideas, and then we go to the software developers and say, okay, is this actually feasible? How much is it gonna cost? And then also thinking about how they'll actually put this in uh, and make it look good, right? So they had the design expertise to contribute there. And finally, we also hired some cultural consultants uh, who were able to infuse this app with indigenous ways of knowing, make sure that it's reflective of the lived experiences of Black, African, and Caribbean families, and also was using anti-oppressive language. So in terms of what we have come up with, this slide here is just showing you a picture of the welcoming page, the login page for the caregiver app. But to give you an idea of how we actually got there, I want to show you kind of where we started and how we ended up here. So really the first design was just laying out where are things going to go, black and white version, we then added some color, refined those colors, and then our Indigenous consultant made the suggestion of including this Ojibwe phrase, which means hello, how are you, uh, as well as the welcome to reflect some diversity in the app and make it feel more welcoming for individuals of different identities. Once we brought that back to our reference group, there was really a conversation around making sure that we're not just reflecting one Indigenous nation or one Indigenous community, but that we should use the languages of all the Indigenous nations uh, that at least uh, work kind of have used the land on which we work. And so there's a discussion around that. And the ultimate decision was uh, to create a Canadian solution that was reflective of the huge multicultural and diversity that we have across this nation. And that's how we ended up with the word cloud that I'm showing you there. So in this brief uh, presentation, unfortunately, I won't have the time to go through in detail all of the different features of this app, but I did want to give you a just little glint or sense of what are some of the things that we have ended up putting into this app. So this here is a uh, layout for the home page of the caregiver app, and just to highlight some of the features here. There are meditation recordings that caregivers can listen to. There's help around doing that cognitive restructuring and uh, questions to help identify what we call hard thoughts in our programs or any negative thoughts that are making a caregiver feel worse. And then support to either kind of use a list or come up with positive coping statements that we call cool thoughts. Finally, under this plan, we have information about all the caregiving tips that caregivers have learned in the group program, but they can access their app to get additional tips or reminders around them. There's some videos uh, about these skills, and then also digital versions of any of the kind of worksheets that they experience or use when they're going through the group programming. So an example, one of the tools that we uh, enable caregivers with is the uh, charting rewards, so a reward chart, and in the app we have a digital version of that so that caregivers can chart those rewards, um, you know, on their phone instead of having to mark it on pen and paper. 
our child app had a very different feel. So we were uh, trying to infuse it with many more games, make it much more enjoyable for a younger population. And just highlighting again, some of the activities that we've put in there. We have a bunch of animations that we've created of Snap the Dragon, our mascot, going through different experiences. And in the app, we've made that into a game so the children can watch those animations go through and then identify in the moment, you know, what's a good plan for Snap to use? Or how do you think Snap is feeling based on what you're seeing in that animation? We also have a different version of this that is uh, with videos of actual children. So something a little similar to what you saw at the beginning of this presentation, but actual kids using SNAP in school in different situations, and then activities around that. We've also built a feelings game. Um, and this is a game where we have different emotions displayed, they're moving around the screen, and the child has to find a certain emotion. The better they get at this, the harder it goes. So the faster those emotion faces move, and that's what allows them to experience that kind of sense of gains, making it more interesting, the better they get at it. We also have a digital version of a kind of journal. This is something that children do in the group program. So they've gotten used to doing this pen and paper while going through group. Now, you know, after group, they have access to this app where they can continue to do it on their phone. Finally, we also have some relaxation recordings there, as well as uh, streaks to help incentivize kids to actually use this app. So the more that they use the app, uh, they get rewarded with these streaks. And then there are also certain challenges for doing things in the app, and they can receive badges for achieving those challenges. So those are the designs, and that's kind of brought us to where we are right now, which is in the phase of production and piloting. But what I've shown you is a linear timeline. And I just want to make very clear that this has not been a linear process at all. And in fact, that there's been many bumps along the way. So just as some examples, we've had to develop a privacy policy that uh, will apply to all of the different jurisdictions in which SNAP programming operates. We've had to figure out an intricate way to limit the access to this app only to children and families who have been through the SNAP program because we know that this is not a replacement for services, this is an add-on for clinical services. And finally, we've also really wanted to be very intentional about avoiding tokenism. So the reality of this process is that we were on a pretty tight timeline and a tight budget but we wanted to make sure that despite those limitations, we were really meaningfully engaging with all of the different voices and all of the different users who would actually be using this app in the end and making sure we're doing that very intentionally in the co-creation process. So in terms of next steps, after we finish the piloting, we'll want to think about how to implement this at a larger scale, how we're going to train facilitators so that they are kind of have that buy-in, they are selling um, or encouraging the families that they're working with to actually use this app. We're going to have to look at user engagement, figure out whether children and families are actually using this, and if not, how we can improve that. And then finally, we also definitely want to do research on effectiveness as well. I'll also note that our work on these child and caregiver apps has expanded our work in other areas. So we've received funding from another organization to build a youth app. And we've also expanded our Snap for Schools app and are building a app for kind of parents of children who are going through the Snap for Schools program. And really our hopes and goals with this project are that eventually kind of across Canada and internationally, caregivers will have access to the parenting and mental health support they need, that children will continue building their emotion regulation, self-control and problem solving skills, and that ultimately we'll be able to continuously improve the health and well-being of SNAP families. So thank you so much to all of the individuals and organizations who have donated either their time or funds and resources in order to make this project possible. It would not be uh, possible at all without their wonderful kind of investments uh, into our idea. 
So thank you all so much. Our contact information's there, but uh, we're also happy to take any questions right now. Thank you, Nina. <laughs> um, well, I'm just gonna start by saying, first of all, tremendous congratulations. I haven't seen an update on this project since we made our funding decision. So it's been a long time and my goodness, how much you have accomplished. It's unbelievable. So congratulations to your whole team. And secondly, how much fun are you having creating such an exciting, <laughs> worthwhile, important product? I, I just, I couldn't help but get excited about it as you took us through the storyline. Um, lots of lots of fun, Akila, but it wouldn't have been possible without your support. So thank you. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, our team was uh, certainly our assessment team was very impressed with uh, your application and, and uh, everything that we went through to um, arrive at the decision to fund you folks. And I'm so glad that the team selected you. So, um, so I have a question uh, in the chat. Uh, hello, yes. is this SNAP program purchased by individual schools or is it a licensed product that a school board would purchase? Good. Uh, so great question, Leanne. Um, thanks for asking that. So we have had schools um, ask to implement the program, but we've also had school boards. So we work on various levels. It's much easier to work from a board level, but absolutely, we have also implemented and worked directly with schools. So if you're interested, you can give uh, me a um, a call. We're um, looking at um, whether or not where school boards are and depending where your school or your school board is, uh, we can discuss that absolutely. Great, thank you. Another question. Uh, the comment is, uh, first off, I love the designs of both apps and I'm so excited to be able to use them. What would be the difference between the youth app you're intending to build and the child, child app you've been building? Excellent question again. Maybe Nina, would you like to tackle that question? Because there are differences. Yeah, absolutely. So with the child app, we're really trying to kind of incorporate a lot of that animated dragon, make it very uh, child friendly, simple language. With the youth app, uh, we've really strived and we're in the process of building that up, but thinking about the content as being relevant to what are the issues that children that youth are facing, what's relevant to them, and making sure that within that SNAP app, we're addressing those aspects for it. So uh, a lot of different content in terms of the topics that are covered in there, uh, although obviously the SNAP strategy is still there uh, embedded throughout. And we were very fortunate, Mark may be able to enhance that question is through our SNAP U Justice model or SNAP Youth app, youth programming is we had snap grew up <laughs> snap looks a little bit more tougher he's playing basketball he's doing all these other things and so therefore we were fortunate to be able to draw on some of the um things that were working really well that the kid that the youth liked and engaged well with yeah we we had the good fortune with that to be able to pull a lot of material from one of our other programs so it's it's been great and it's, and that's also an exciting build as well but i want to say Akila, it is so exciting to see this app come together uh, we we just have big smiles every time we see something I'm come sure. back from the <laughs> I had a sense of that just by yeah, watching sure. um, the visuals. Um, yeah. um, I have a background in education as well. So um, I just uh, I, I just thought it was very exciting to mm -hmm. see how this had evolved. A couple more questions uh, from the chat. Do you uh, envision that it would be made available at the beginning of a SNAP 13 week session so that they can be using while attending the group with the risk they drop out before completing or at the end of the group sort of a graduation gift? And is there a cost? So we can we can all answer that question at different we might have different lenses from that but um, the app is really intended to help with generalization and ongoing support of enhancement we know from the neuroscience studies that the more these kids are practicing and the families are practicing using the strategies, the more that's being embedded within their brains and then and, and, and really getting those synapses um, moving and changing. So at this point, it was designed to be given towards probably the middle to the end so that they could start using it. But at the same time, as we think about this more and more, 
this would be a really great thing for them to have fun and start using it um, while they're during groups so that this way they can start to um, use their SNAP skills more easily and readily. So um, kids get code mission assignments, which is a tiny little assignment after each session, same with the parents or the caregivers. So it might be something that we could think about. We'll have to see. I have to ask my researcher, Marg, what she thinks as well. <laughs> in regards to fidelity practices, right? We all monitor fidelity. So yeah, I, I think initially, as you say, Lee, the, the prototype, we consider this a bit of a prototype to get out into the field just to see how it works in the field. And until we get a feeling for that, I think we'll be a bit cautious about when we release. But as Lena said, at some point when we feel that they've got the skill enough that they can take the app and then help use it. But really, as a prototype, we'll be a bit cautious because like as that uh, person that was asking the question, you don't want people thinking it's a substitute. Yeah, we don't want to sub. And Nina, can I ask the reference group? Has the re has that come up in the reference group at all? Yes. Um, so what we've been hearing from uh, participants and from clinicians is that they would love to have this accessible during group. Uh, so it's definitely something that we're probably thinking about. Um, and just uh, you know, maybe not the first week, maybe once they've at least learned about STAP and what stop now and plan really means, uh, once they have some context for using the app that we would integrate that. Um, so uh, we have about a minute left and uh, I think I have time for two more questions here. Uh, one is excellent app, excited for families to use it. Is there tracking if children and parents are actually doing code mission home practice? Nina or Mark, you want to answer that? Are they are we tracking that they're actually using the app or doing their code missions or things like that? We are tracking the use of the app from the stats in the back end of things. We are going to be rolling it up and, and linking it to sort of aggregate results from groups, et cetera, because we can't, you know, obviously link to individual children and families as such. So we're rolling it up. But in terms of the homework, we're from the SNAP core group, we haven't linked that yet. That's sort of the next level. Once we're, like I said, we see what the SNAP is like in the field and how we can enhance it, but that would be probably a next step. Great, and uh, last question. Given the incredibly long wait times for clinical services, do you think a version of this could be made available more broadly? Example, while children and youth are on a wait list. Yeah, Patricia, excellent question. We're all concerned about waiting lists. And one of the things that the Child Development Institute has done in Toronto is try to really work hard to reduce our waiting list. Um, but the waiting list at one point was like two and a half years. I think we're down to a year for boys and six months for girls. And some of our other affiliate sites might have similar types of waiting lists. Um, it's a great idea, um, but that's something I guess we'll take back and think about, you know, about what could we provide our waitlist families if, you know, in the interim without it being a replacement, because that's our biggest concern is we don't want someone to think that they could just do this. And especially if they're considered in that top 2% of clinical need, we don't want them to get, uh, you know, misled on that one. Uh, I'm just going to touch in, uh, touch base with my colleague Sarah here uh, to make sure, um, I don't know if she has a final question or to make sure uh, that we don't have anything else to cover off. I'm all good. I think uh, we've had some fantastic questions. So everything that I yeah, would have asked has been asked. Um, yeah. And I know we're, we're coming up on the end of our time. So I'm, I'm all good. Yes, well, uh, I just want to thank you on behalf of Mental Health Research Canada and Lena, I'll be following up with you because I'll have to uh, line your team up to present to our uh, board of directors. They would love to hear about this project. Uh, our uh, next meeting that we have availability is in March. So hopefully we're planning far enough ahead that we can get into your calendars and, and we can uh, chat about that. So a uh, pleasure meeting you, uh, Margaret and Nina. I'm seeing lots of thank yous in the, the chat. Oh, and Lena from you. <laughs> um, and uh, it was I'm thanking great everybody else. <laughs> great presentation. Uh, you brought it to life beautifully. Uh, very exciting work. And uh, we're so pleased to be associated with it. Uh, so thank you and congratulations. And my goodness, if we don't chat with you before the holidays, have a wonderful holiday season. We're in December. Excellent. I'm not too sure where October and November went, but uh, here we are, holiday season's approaching. Uh, stay safe, spend great time with family and friends, and uh, wish you well for uh, 